You can look up my notes, uh, as always, on my blog. You can find them at pastorkeithjackson.blogspot.com. That just rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? And um, the base scripture this morning, we're going to look at Acts 2. We're just going to look at one thing in Acts 2, and uh, other scriptures I mentioned will come up here. So are you all glad you came? Are you all happy? Okay, some of you are happy, some of you are not glad you came, you're not sure. But uh, it's good to be in the house of God, isn't it? It's good to be here. We've just had a prayer week, which was really lovely. We had a great time praying, both online, in person, and uh, really encouraged by those of you that that joined us, um, and particularly uh, bucking a trend that the in-person prayer times were, were better attended than the online prayer times. And that's really good. That's really good. And, uh, so, and I think our, our culture is, is shifting back a little bit to realize that whilst online is useful, and, uh, and we do use it, and we have, you know, if we think of just our thought for a week that we put out, I think we regularly have a, what they call 100 meaningful views. In other words, people watch the whole thing every week. Uh, and that's, we can't turn off that's people from church or other people that goes around the world. On, online is useful for us. If you're watching online this morning, we welcome you. We trust that the Lord's going to bless you this morning. But, uh, t- but to be with the people of God, there's something about that, isn't there? There's something about the power of God when we gather together, when we worship together, when we pray together. So uh, thank you for supporting the prayer week. And uh, already, you know, this morning I've had a couple of people sharing a bit of testimony of things God's done in their life because they met in prayer. So God is good. Amen. So we're going to look today a little bit at uh, what I've called the refresh button part two. Last week, um, we talked uh, about our four priorities that we're going to focus on for the next stage of of all nations development. And we talked about mission. And by mission, we mean reaching out with the good news, both home and away. We talked about discipleship. We skimmed over these a bit, but uh, by that we mean teaching and equipping people to become more like Jesus. We talked about worship, the facilitating of authentic worship where everyone is invited to encounter the presence of God. And we spoke about legacy, the nurturing and investing in our children, teenagers, and young adults, the future church today. And we dwelt on that. One of the things that really encouraged me about the prayer week was how many people were praying into those priorities. It really blessed me because I thought, you know, you're never sure if people have heard or if they've got it. Um, And I was really encouraged that you'd obviously written it down. And uh, we're praying into it and continue to pray into it. And we said, we we wrapped this all up into a, a fresh vision statement of making Jesus known to everyone, everywhere. If you want to know what all nations is about, it's about that statement. It's about making Jesus known to everyone everywhere. And through this year, we're going to unpack those themes. We're going to look at them a bit more sort of on a rolling basis. Um, you know, we have a guest speaker next week. I won't tell you who that is because I don't want to spoil the surprise. Um, but Ellie's dad is coming. <laughs> so I, was, I am given his name. But Ellie's dad's here. So anything you want to know about Ellie next week. Um, so he's going to be speaking, but at the end of the month, we're going to begin starting looking at mission, and we're going to go through that. And we want to make sure that the church is moving. Is uh, not, you know, there might be other things that we could be doing, but we want to be moving in the same direction. We want to have not two visions, because that's division. We want to be able to say, this is what we are about This is what we're inviting people to be part of in terms of belonging to a local church. But I want to talk today about an aspect that will help those four priorities and that vision become more of a reality for us. And uh, I want to just say, we're going to look at Acts 2 or something there, but you can't fly with broken wings, now, there was a song about that, Don't Burst Into Song, if you, if you remember that. But you can't fly with broken wings. And Acts 2, verse 42 to 47, an often preached passage about what the church should be in doing. Um, but I, I, I wonder if you're going to notice what I notice in this. Just one thing, one little nuance. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. 
And everyone was filled with awe of the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. And all the believers were together and had everything in common. And they sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. And they broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Amen. Now we could spend weeks and weeks and weeks just on those five verses and begin to discover some things that that God would have for us. But there's just one thing I want to mention out of there this morning. And that is the organization and structure of the church. (coughs) Excuse me. Still got post lurgy cough. How God structured and organized the church. The people, it says, met together in a main gathering place. That would have been in the early days of the church, the very beginning stages in the temple courts. They gathered together. Eventually, they were scattered and they would meet um, beside catacombs. They would uh, form places beside rivers. They would meet in open. But they also met in people's homes. And actually, that's where they celebrated the Lord's Supper. That's where they broke bread. And people sometimes will get up and say, well, we only do communion once a month in church. I'm missing communion. But actually, if we're going to be biblical about it and really sort of say, well, the, the main place for that tended to be in smaller groups. Didn't tend to be in the open temple courts because actually they couldn't celebrate it in the open, open temple courts in that way. Communion was subversive. It was dangerous. It was done secretly. Wow. That's amazing, isn't it? And so we need to be un- understand something of how God organized things. And I believe that the Lord organized his church with two meeting places. Two places that they met. A man called William Beckham in a book called The Second Reformation, writes about this. He says, the creator once created a church with two wings. One wing was the large group celebration. The other was for small group community. Using both wings, the church could soar into the heavens, entering into his presence, and to do his will over the earth. But after a few hundred years of soaring high across the earth, the two-wing church began to question the need for the small group wing. The two-wing church that has soared into the heavens was by, for now, by all practical purposes, one-winged. From time to time, the church dreamed of flying into the presence of the Creator and doing his will over the earth. In compassion, the Creator stretched out his hand and began to reshape his church so it could use both wings again. And once again, the Creator possessed a church that could fly into his presence and soar over all the earth, fulfilling his purposes and plans. <coughs> this year, from today, really, we're going to relaunch our small group system. So I look across the church and how many come here, and then I look at who belongs to home groups in their, in their current form, who belongs to those, and I realize that we have probably four or five active groups. And some of you put your name down and say, oh, I'm in that group, but you never go. You're, you're kind of listed on our, sister, you know, on, on our admin system. That's the group I belong to. And then when I ask the leader, well, you know, so-and-so goes to your group. Well, we haven't seen them in about 18 months. No, they don't come here. We don't know well, where they go. Oh, we don't know. We've dropped something. And I want to implore with you and show you some spiritual principles of why small groups are important. Why if we're to fulfill our vision, we are each going to have to belong to a smaller community within all nations. It's going to become more and more important. See, our our purpose is to, um, to be missional, to make disciples, to worship, to create that legacy feeling, to make Jesus known to everyone everywhere. We're not going to do that just by coming on a Sunday. We need further equipping. We need further discipleship in our life. 
And my dream as I, I look across here, one of the things that really excites pastors sometimes doesn't excite everyone else. But this excites pastors because pastors like the fact when we run out of chairs, which happened this morning. No one else really likes that because it means more work for everybody else. But pastors like that. We like that because we're called to gather. We're called to disciple. We're called to grow things. And I believe that if we were to join a small group, as I'm going to outline in a moment what they mean for us moving forward, we will grow in several ways. We will grow spiritually as we grow closer to Jesus. We will grow in our serving as we seek to serve others and encourage other members of the group. And we will flourish. See, healthy groups should grow numerically, and they should eventually subdivide. If you're already part of a home group, or as what we're going to call them, growth groups moving forward, you'll already understand some of these principles. But I want to outline this to you, because I'm going to ask for an unusual response. I'm not going to ask you to put up your hand and say, yeah, I live in, in Woodley, I'm going to a Woodley group or whatever. We're not going to do that. But we are going to do something a little bit different in terms of response. So what will belonging to a growth group do for you? Well, firstly, you'll have an opportunity to show love. People often say to me, and and churches where I've pastored, they say, you know, the church is getting too big. Church is getting too big. And what that means is we reach a point where we don't know everybody's name. And so we automatically think the church is too big. I want to underline this if you're making notes. All Nations is not too big. It is not fully grown. Can I say that again? You're pondering that. What does that mean? All Nations is not too big, but it is not fully grown. But to help the growth, we need another way. We need to be able to say it's not about the size of our building that contains our growth. There needs to be another way forward. And I believe that the, the, the groups give us a way to show love. See, the two wings of church life involve our Sunday service. But we need a second group, a growth group, as individuals and as a church, to be able to fly, to be able to grow beyond that. If I can put it this way, a growth group is a fantastic way of making a larger church feel small again. A growth group is a fantastic way of making a larger church feel small again. So when people say to me, oh, it's too big, the vision's too big, the church is too big, it's not too big. I was reflecting on this, not in my notes, but I was reflecting on this and something my dear old mum used to say to me when I was at school. And uh, every August would be go buy school uniforms or find school uniforms or see what my brother had grown out of and what fitted me day. And that would be it. And uh, I can remember putting on this shirt. I think it belonged to my brother. If you met my brother, he's considerably bigger than me. And um, I, I'd, I put on this shirt, and the sleeves, I mean, they covered my hands. They were down here. as I was walking along, almost dragging them on the ground, it felt like. But they covered my hands. And uh, she wasn't a Christian at the time, and, and I complained bitterly and said, look, can't I have a new shirt? Can't I have a shirt that fits me? And she said these words, you'll grow into it. Oh, some of you have got painful memories that have just resurfaced now. You're like, yeah, I was a second child. I know what that's like. Hand me down so you'll grow into it. Do you know what? My brother's arms are far longer than mine. He actually does drag his knuckles on the ground sometimes, but I have to be careful. But um, he's not watching because he's preaching somewhere else today. Um, I don't think I ever did grow into that shirt properly. See, you cast a vision that's bigger than we currently have with the belief that we're going to grow into it. When God gives you a promise in your life, it is bigger than your current situation, with the belief that you're going to grow into it. See, the promises of God are true and amen in Christ Jesus, are they not? The things that God has promised you for your life speak of a future that he desires for you, but that future doesn't fit you today because you need to grow into it. And so we need to grow into it. And one of the things that we need to do as a church to make a larger church feel small is to get into a small group opportunity to show love. Romans 15 verse 7 says, Accept one another then, just as Christ accepted you, 
in order to bring praise to God. Isn't that lovely? Accept one another as Christ has accepted you. A beautiful verse. It reminds me that if I'm looking for a perfect church, I'm not going to find it. And if I find it by joining it, I make it imperfect. Isn't that right? When people say to others, I found the perfect church, I'm going to go to all nations, I've moved to the area, I've got saved and it's perfect. As soon as you join, it's not perfect anymore. Not because of you, but nothing is perfect in that sense, is it? Because when we talk about the perfect church, we're really talking about my needs are met. And I think the perfect church is one that is looking to meet the needs of others. May not be perfect in everything it does, may not have every philosophy, may not be the slickest and all of those kind of things. It may not you know, be the most popular, but it's looking to show love. It's looking to proclaim something bigger than itself. And love brings us to unity, how good and pleasant it is when the brothers live together in unity, Psalm 133, 1. I'm going to show my age now, if that's all right. Yes, some of you are going to be amazed that I'm over 35. (laughs) Wait. All right, I have to add VAT. And every other tax. Thank you, Barbie. I liked it better when you sit on the front row. Less heckling. Let me show you my age. Anyone remember the TV show Cheers? Some of you are like, what? what? There was Stevie. I think this was like early 80s, was it George? Late 70s, early 80s. And uh, there was a song about a bar in Boston. And uh, when you walked in, everyone was like, hi, how are you? Call your name. So if George walked in, I know you never would, George, because you're, you're a good elder. We walked in, everyone would turn around and go, George, you know, big welcome. How are you doing? Pull up a seat. It was wonderful. And the theme tune for that, I'm not going to sing it to you, but George will. The theme tune included these words. Sometimes you want to go where everyone knows your name. And they're always glad you came. How come? You know, in that bar, there was only ever half a dozen people sitting around the bar. It was never full. I was like, how does this place not go out of business? Because it's a TV drama. See, the thing about a growth group is you get to know people. You get to know everyone's name. There was another show came on later than this, Friends. It's had a bit of a renaissance. You know, who watches Friends still? That's amazing. Most of you that are watching Friends weren't born when it came out. You know, you're so enamored by the entertainment that we had as young married, you know, struggling to find our way and all these kind of things. Isn't that amazing? It's had this renaissance. And is, is, I think it's more popular now than it probably was back in the day. In that theme tune, I'm not going to sing it for you, but Aaron might. In that theme tune, it says, I'll be there for you when the rain starts to pour. I'll be there for you like I've been there before. I'll be there for you because you're there for me too. What do these two comedy shows know? It wasn't the comedy that kept people tuning in. It was the friendships the relationships, what people felt was lacking was that they didn't have those kind of friendships in their life. Friendships and love in growth groups, so powerful. If you feel like you're sitting alone in all nations, you need to be in a growth group. You need to go, you know, shake, uh, Pastor Billy and I would take it in turns shaking hands at the door and all that kind of thing, you know, because it's expected. You know, people get upset if they haven't sh- sh- shook the hand of a pastor. That's okay. We don't mind doing that. But that's not relationship. That's not relationship. It's really hard to have quality time there. Growth groups will give you that. Also in the growth group, there will be an opportunity to help. In Galatians chapter 5, we read, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge in the flesh. That's the bit we always preach on. But serve one another humbly in love. Make a choice about what you're going to do with your time, your skills, and your talents. When people say to me, Oh, I I feel called to a ministry. I I really want to be used in church. And what they're really saying is, You've got to let me preach. Because they think that the only thing that happens in church happens here on a Sunday. So when we say to them, I, I can remember this conversation with, with our beloved Pastor Billy. 
having come back from Africa the first time, and uh, I don't know if you remember this, but it stuck with me. And um, I, I said, you know, I'm just, I just want to serve the church. You know, I used to be one of those guys that if you weren't putting me on the platform, you know, you were, you were an apostate pastor kind of thing. But uh, I'll, I'll just do whatever. And he said, well, there's a mop. Clean the men's toilets. There's the keys to the minibus. Drive the minibus. And I did those things faithfully for a, for a while. You know, there was a time in this church when, um, when I would hover by the gents' loos. And if, so, if a man went in there and then came out, I'd go in and check and make sure he hadn't splashed. <laughs> I did. <laughs> Barbie used to say to me, you care more about that toilet than you do the one at home. <laughs> I said, yeah, but those men, they don't use our toilet at home and you should be glad they don't. <laughs> there's, some, there's some education we need to do around that. You know, Mike, there's some things there for men ministry for you to think about. <laughs> And so, I would do that. I drove the church minibus, and I gave up driving the church minibus after I took a group of people. If you were on the minibus for this occasion, forgive me for what I'm going to share, but I have forgiven you. <clears throat> I drove people into London to see Ron Cannoli. Oh, it was lovely. It was great. I mean, the Ron Cannoli thing was brilliant. We had a 17-seater seater bus, uh, seater minibus. 15 people in there thought they knew the better way. This is before sat-nav and navigation and phones and everything. So I'm driving through London with a group of people that I want to drop off at the Baptist church. And, you know, cause it was so, and the one person who didn't have a driving license piped up and said, I'm sure Keith knows the way. <laughs> and so at that point I gave up driving the minibus, gave the keys. I'm not doing that anymore, though, really, because... They're not good for, today we'd say they're not good for my mental health, but actually they weren't good for my potential to have a criminal record. <laughs> it's just all kinds of things. You know, serving and giving help will put us in an environment where we're tested. Where we're tested. And so often we don't want to be tested. But I believe the way the church is made of fellowship is that no one stands alone. The way a church becomes a fellowship is that no one stands alone. And no one should stand alone in this church. And that's why growth groups become important. Because that's where we learn that people need help. What the help is. We're not talking big massive things here. We're not talking about everyone's you know, huge histories. But from time to time, each of us needs some support. Each of us need a little bit of guidance. Each of us needs some prayer. Each of us needs someone to stand beside us and say, you know what? Uh, we, can, we can help with that. And so we can be those kind of people. In a growth group, you'll find there's an opportunity to give guidance. Colossians 3.16 says, Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly, as you teach and admonish one another with all hymns, through psalms, um, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. We all know that two heads are better than one. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron. So one man and a woman can sharpen another. But notice what the Bible says, how to develop the ability to give guidance. You have to let the message of Christ dwell in you richly. You cannot give guidance from the word if you do not know the word. So much of what goes on in Christendom, in the, in, in the church around the world, and I... You know, I've, I've seen some of this as in my travels, is that what is preached is really just self-help messages. You know, and we've, we've forgotten the fact that we have to let the word of God dwell in us richly. Richly. And so, I want to say to you, you know more than you think you know, which is good news. God might give you a revelation and insights. But I want you to know this, not all the teaching that happens in church happens from the platform on a Sunday morning. It doesn't. It happens in a growth group. It happens in a, in a small group where we're learning together, where we're delving into scriptures. And growth groups will give you an opportunity to reach out. In Acts 1 verse 8 we read this, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. Amen. We love that. Because we've got our vision, we've got our priorities, but we're a Pentecostal church. Yeah. That means we believe in the moving of the Spirit. 
means we believe in the gifts of the Spirit. It means that we believe that you can speak in tongues, you can interpret tongues, that there's gifts of healing, that we can expect miracles, that we can see things happen. Yes. Amen. <clears throat> you will receive power when the Spirit comes on you. But why does the Spirit send power? And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria until the ends of the earth. See, today's church want the power without the witness. But if you want more power, the way to get it is not to just say, God, fill me again. The way to get more power is to witness a bit more. Share your faith a bit more. I tell you what, you'll have more power than you know what to do with. So, well, really, Keith? Really? It's an antagonistic world out there. It's a difficult world. We're, we're scared. <clears throat> we might end up being opposed. We might find it difficult. You know, shortly after this, we find in Acts 2. Are you all right? Sorry. Was someone looking through the window? <laughs> no, you're all right, Mike. We appreciate you. In Acts 2, we find something else, that the power came. The Holy Spirit came. Gifts were manifested in the church. On that day, pre Peter preaches a sermon when everyone else thinks he's drunk. And, and 5,000 people come to the Lord that day. Hallelujah. Yeah. Acts 3, they take that onto the streets. There's a healing. Acts 4, they're persecuted and thrown in jail. Hallelujah. Yeah. And all, all of you are like... Oh. It gets uncomfortable. If you read through Acts 4, they, they actually pray. They say, Lord, consider their threats. Consider their threats. We say much the same prayer today. Lord, consider what the world is looking like. Consider the activists. Consider the things that are being taught and thrown at our kids and thrown at us in the streets and thrown at us everywhere. Consider that, Lord, expecting God to come down from heaven and to lift the activists out and drop them on an abandoned island somewhere that will never bother us again. But what is the response in Acts chapter 4? Lord, consider their threats. The ground shook. The spirit came and they were filled again with power. And what then? They preached the word of God even more boldly. That's what the Bible tells us. When you say, Lord, consider the opposition at my work, expect an infilling. Expect the power to come. So I can't, I don't want to be that kind of Christian. My friends, you don't get to choose which kind of Christian you are. You're saved or you're not saved. You're born again or you're not born again. You're baptized in the Holy Spirit or not baptized in the Holy Spirit, but you can make a choice about what to do with the power that God has given you. And so we want to say that our growth groups are going to be deliberately missional as well. <clears throat> I've produced uh, for this year, and there are some new groups starting up in the coming weeks, but I've produced this year a whole year's worth of material and guidelines for growth groups, whole year. Some of you are like, really? Some of the, some of the home groups um, were really good. They'll go and get a study and they'll study it and those kind of things. But we never know what's being studied. And often it's really, really good. <clears throat> but this is made easy. This year we're going to look at the parables of Jesus. Next year we're going to look, God willing, at the miracles of Jesus. 2026, we're going to look, God willing, at the hard sayings of Jesus. You're like, you're thinking three years ahead, Keith. Yes, talk to my wife. How frustrating her life is. How, you know, yes, uh, a couple of days ago, I was having a conversation with her, and she was, we were talking about something, and she said, but why? And I said, well, in 11 years' time. <laughs> so, you know, thank God you're not married to me. That's not true. She's like, yeah. But anyway, we've got a plan here for our discipleship, for our worship, for our legacy, for our mission. And so every new group, every growth group that starts up will follow this material. We'll be going through that. You see, the point of it being missional and the rhythm of this, let me just say what the rhythm is. For three weeks, you meet together in your home or in a coffee shop or in the university campus, or wherever it is. It's designed in such a way you could do the meeting anywhere, really. You meet for three weeks. On the fourth week, you don't study the word. What? God forbid that we don't. On the fourth week, 
you have what we call a social time, but you begin to invite friends who are not yet Christians to that one. And you begin to say, you know, during the summer months, I've given lots of ideas in here, but during the summer months, you might see in your street someone struggling to do their lawn. You go and do it. You don't wait for Torch to refer someone to you. You actually go and knock on the door and say, can we come and do your garden one Saturday? That will be your meeting for growth group that, that week. You'll go and do things where you can invite friends to. You see, the, one of the wonderful things about Christmas that we've just had is the amount of visitors that do come through the various services. But for some of your friends, they say no because the first time they're invited to church is come and gather with 250 other people that you don't know. Well, we might want to do that if it's like Queen giving a concert or Ed Sheeran. We'll go and do that. But you want us to come to church with a group of people we don't know. No, we don't know. But if they've been associated with your growth group for six months, nine months, 12 months, however long it takes. You say, you know, a group of us are going to our church over Christmas or over Easter. And we're getting together. Uh, We've got a concert on. We've got something happening. We've got all these kind of things going. Do you know what they're going to say? Yeah, I'll go. Why? Because you're all my friends. Because they want to go where everybody knows their name. They want to go where they know they're going to be loved and supported as well. We have to break down the artificial walls of church. See, when people say to me, and, and, and I'm really missional, you probably gather that anyway, and, and it, it's a headache at times for everyone around me, I guess. I'm really, really missional. People come up and they say pithy things to me, like, the church needs to break out of the walls. And my response to that is, we don't lock you in on a Sunday. What are you doing the other six days of the week? Are you going to a toilet and locking the door? What are you doing? We're not locking you in. You're sent out every week. The church is already out of the walls, but then we build all these artificial walls. We begin to say, my friends won't come to that because da, 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 da. And we put the objections in our minds without it being in their heads. I've only ever had one person say to me, no, I'm not coming to church. I've been a Christian, be this year, 44 years, I think it is, Sheila, you can probably tell me, yeah, 44 years, my God. we've aged well, haven't we, became a Christian about in the same time, and um, I think I've only ever had one person say to me, all oh, right, I am not coming to church, and that was my mother, and three years later, she was in church, worshipping Jesus, I accept the challenge, I accept the challenge, not everyone I've invited to church has become a Christian, of course I haven't. Not everyone that I've invited to is to something to do with church, like our family fun day. You know, there are people in our church today who came last year to our family fun day because there was a free hamburger. But they came. Why? Because they're like, they're a friendly lot. They're nice people. See, you are nice people. <laughs> Turn to the person next to you. I don't often do that, no, but... <laughs> Because you may not get the answer you want. Well, actually, I'm, I'm sitting here because there were no other chairs left. So we have to break down the artificial barriers. There are some real barriers, but there are artificial ones. A growth group will begin to do that for us. And so <clears throat> next month, I'm going to be giving you a very simple tool. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but a very simple tool about how to witness to your friends. Witnessing made easy and so the picture of the airplane with an exploding engine (laughs) if you're going on holiday next week you may want to look away now I spoke at the beginning about a two-winged church let me put it another way for you an airplane that loses power in one of its engines doesn't automatically crash and it doesn't fly around in circles but what it will do is it will lose altitude. It loses the power to fly higher. It'll lose altitude. Sometimes if it's weighed down, it'll have to make an emergency landing. And my fear for all nations, the travesty would be as if we have to make an emergency landing. I don't want to make an emergency landing. I want us to fly higher than we currently are. I want both wings of the church to be fully fueled and to be ready to soar. Now you might say to me, I can't go to a growth group. I'm too busy. I've got family. I've got kids. I've got this. I've got the other. You know, I can remember when our our kids were little 
And uh, Pastor Billy, after I cleaned the toilets for a while and not crashed the minibus, um, said to me, would I lead the house group in Whitley? Uh, well, Shinfield, up in the back of Shinfield. I went there. And, um, and we went there and we led it. And it grew. And, uh, and it grew and it had to subdivide. And then we went to Bible college. And so um, Dan Rubens, I think, took over the group. And after a year or so, Dan Rubens went to Bible college. I think then the guns maybe got involved. And then the guns went to Bible college. And then the house group closed. Because <laughs> it seemed to me, it be, I don't know if this is why it closed, but it closed. It seemed to me, people started to think, if you go there, you go to Bible college. Don't go to that group. You know. But what we used to do, we used to take our young family and we used to put them in bed. In there. It wasn't in our house. It would have been more convenient for us to be in our house, but it wasn't in our house. We used to take them there to go to bed. We wouldn't dream of thinking of doing that today. We wouldn't dream of doing it. But our kids grew up hearing us studying and praying together. They grew up knowing that. Sometimes they'd come and just, you know, if they wouldn't sleep, they'd come and sit on my lap or whatever. We, we did that. We did that because we were enthusiastic. Now, I know some of you, even in today's world, I'm talking 30-odd years ago, you are working longer hours. You have things and pressures on you that we didn't have. But if I can say, if you cannot make time to be in a small group, whether that's lunchtime at work, whether that's in a cafe, wherever it is, then you need to reprioritize your life. The only people that will remember that you worked extra long hours in 20 years are going to be your kids. Your employer will forget you. Your boss, who keeps prevailing on you, will forget you. Maybe your wife will forget you as well. You need to be careful around that. Maybe your husband will. Only people that are going to remember that stuff is going to be your kids. So my kids, they say to me, Dad, you know, when you started out in the ministry, you worked really long hours. We knew that, but we also knew we were a priority for you. We also knew you created time for us. And finding that balance really, really hard. Really hard. But my friends, if you want to soar, you're going to have to be in a small group as well. If you want to feel like you really contribute and belong to all nations, you're going to have to be in a growth group. Because really, there's no other way for that. And that means that the continued overtime, the continued overworking, the continued pressure on you, you're going to have to have some discussions with your managers. Say, you know, Tuesday nights, I'm not available. Thursday nights, whenever it is, I'm not available. This is something for me that I have to do. And if you allow me to do it for my well-being, you will find I am more productive the day after than if I didn't go. Tell you what, your manager will rip your arm off for that. Because they just want productivity. And so we need to look at that. And so how are we going to respond to this this outline? This it's, it's not a desperate plea because at the end of the day, if I'm honest, my life's much easier if you all just come on a Sunday and listen and pay your tithe. All right? Growth groups throw up all kinds of issues and extra work and all the rest of it, but I don't mind the extra work. And I don't mind that. I don't mind the pastoral stuff that comes out of those kind of things. I don't mind all of those things that come with it. Because actually, this is for your benefit, not for mine. This is for you, not for me. This is for you to grow and become a strong missional disciple of Jesus, not for me. It's for you to grow. Isn't that exciting? And it's free. It just means we need to re- reorder. So how are we going to respond to that? Well, <clears throat> for the next five minutes, the worship team are not going to come just yet. For the next five minutes, I want you to answer these questions. And how you're going to answer them is you're going to actually talk to someone sitting beside you or someone you don't know. And if you're sitting next to someone you don't like, just grin and bear it. Because, of course, that's not the case. You'll love each other. And I want you to finish three, these three statements, and I want you to tell it each other. So you could say, all of these threes, I belong to a growth group, and I love what? What is it that you love about being in that group? Some of you are in house groups. Now, the majority of you, the answer is going to be, I don't belong to a growth group. Because. And then you need to monitor your excuses. It might just be, well, I haven't really thought about it. Well, I do this, I do that, do the other. You need to tell someone why. And if someone, if you're listening to that and they make a really thin excuse, like, well, you know, I'm just a bit tired in the evenings. We're all tired in the evenings. We all are. I'm tired in the evenings. You know, but challenge it. 
challenge it and say, well, if I go to a new one, will you come with me? Oh, boy. Oh, boy. The last question is, should we host a growth group? And what I mean by that is, have you got a home or somewhere... I've already had a couple of people come to me, even before I was preaching, and say, it's New Year, I feel God wants me to, to host a, a small group in my home. I'm like, has God been reading my notes? I mean, you would think God might have told me to say it, wouldn't you? But do you want to host one? Because what I'd love to see for the size of our church is that we have at least one growth group in every ward of Reading. Now, we don't have people coming here from every ward of Reading. Maple Durham is a ward of Reading. It's a, it's a county ward, uh, a local ward. We don't have people, I don't think, coming from Maple Durham, but one day we might. But there are 16 wards in Reading. For the size of our church, we should have at least 16 groups meeting midweek in some form. We should. We shouldn't be having four. I shouldn't be having people come to me and say, I live in this area, where can I go midweek? Yeah, sorry, you can't. You have to travel nine miles. That's happened since I've been there. That happened in the last three months. I had to say to somebody, there isn't anywhere. Do you want to meet online? And what they said to me was, uh, I, online's okay, but I spend my day on screens. I'd like to be in person. Now, two of our current groups do meet online. You can continue that. We'll need some online groups, but newer groups, they're going to be in person. I really believe that a shift has come. So, you've got five minutes or so, maybe three, and I'm giving you permission to talk to each other. <laughs> this is unusual, because if you're British and have not been introduced, you're going to struggle with this. But if you're from another nation, you'll be fine with it. If you're not sitting next to each other, go to someone, answer those three questions, and then the worship team will come up when I tell them to, and... Uh, We'll do that. So talk. How are you going to respond? <laughs> Amen. Well, come back to us. We're going to close our time together by singing a worship song. Or a praise song, I'm not sure, but we're going to sing something. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Actually, someone came up to me just now and said, I live in Maple Durham. So, uh, something about, <laughs> hallelujah. That's great. Some of you would have turned around and said, oh, I don't, I don't go to a group. And some of you would be saying, well, we lead a group, come to ours. <laughs> Did anyone actually do that? No, don't answer, because that would be like, you know, it's great. It's just amazing. Next week, we have, uh, as I say, guest speaker Dan uh, Rubens will be speaking so you'll get some proper Bible teaching this month as well. Don't worry, it's coming. But we really wanted to reset our focus these last couple of weeks on what we're doing as a church. And I appreciate you in, uh, allowing us the, the leeway to do that and to be able to say this is where we're going. If you feel that you want to host a, a, a growth group, if you're like, well, I've got the space, like someone else came to me last week, come and see me. I'm going to go over here. Pastor Billy will be on the door today shaking hands. I'm going to go over here. Just come and give me your name and uh, we can compile this and we can start to say to people, this is where groups are going to be meeting. Is that all right? Have you enjoyed today? Yeah. <laughs> well, God is good. <clears throat> so Auntie Millie will come and close in prayer after this song. Amen. <laughs>